a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained the promises. They closed the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped the devouring sword. Out of weakness they were made powerful, became strong in battle, and turned back foreign invaders. Women received back their dead through resurrection. Some were tortured and would not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others endured mockery, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death at sword's point. They went about in skins of sheep or goats, needy, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered about in deserts and on mountains, in caves and in crevices in the earth. Yet all these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. God had foreseen something better for us, so that without us they should not be made perfect. The word of the Lord. Let your hearts take comfort, all who hope in the Lord. How great is the goodness, O Lord, which you have in store for those who fear you, and which, toward those who take refuge in you, you show in the sight of the children of men. You hide them in the shelter of your presence from the plottings of men. You screen them within your abode from the strife of tongues. Let your all the Blessed be the Lord, whose marvelous mercy he has shown me in a fortified city. Let your all the Lord. Once I said in my anguish, I am cut off from your sight. Yet you heard the sound of my pleading when I cried out to you. Love the Lord, all you his faithful ones. The Lord keeps those who are constant, but more than requites those who act proudly. Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea, to the territory of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, at once a man from the tombs who had an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles smashed, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. 
Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure you, by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, Unclean spirit, come out of the man. He asked him, What is your name? He replied, Legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him not to drive them away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside. And they pleaded with him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he let them. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they were drowned. The swine herds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside, and people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then they began to beg him to leave their district. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with him. But Jesus would not permit him and told him instead, go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him and all were amazed. Fabum Domini. As we proceed through the Gospel of Mark, we continue to witness Jesus as he exercises his divine authority during his public ministry. You know, he teaches in the synagogue at Capernaum with an authority that the people had not heard before from the scribes. He casts out an unclean spirit from someone who was in that congregation. And he exercises his authority over the effects of sin through various healings and signs. And then today, Jesus ventures into Gentile territory and encounters a man who is possessed with a demon. This is yet another opportunity for Jesus to display his absolute power over these malicious spirits. Now, there's a, a fairly well-known exorcist, Father Chad Ripperger, who's a, you know, a seasoned exorcist, and he give, has given talks on the topics of spiritual warfare and demonic activity. And he explains in one of his talks how you know, oftentimes movies about exorcisms are inaccurate when it comes to you know, certain details in the movies. Usually when the exorcist priest enters the room with the possessed person, the movie tends to portray this priest as you know, shaking with fear as he goes in. But in reality, Father Ripperger says that it is usually the opposite. You know, when an experienced exorcist enters the room, it is the demon that is scared to death. You see, the priest himself is not the cause of this fear, but rather it is the 500 pound gorilla behind the priest, Jesus Christ. The priest does not come with his own authority, but he comes in the power and authority of Jesus Christ. That's who's terrifying the demon. The demon knows that he is about to be beaten so badly that he eventually shuts down. So this helps to make sense of the vehement reaction today of the demon to the presence of Jesus. Even though the demon absolutely despises God and he knows that he is completely powerless in the presence of the divine, Jesus has total authority, even over demons. You know, this is not the soft hippie Jesus 
that we often see portrayed in movies, but rather he exercises fearsome authority. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches in paragraph 550, Jesus' exorcisms free some individuals from the domination of demons. They anticipate Jesus' great victory over the ruler of this world. The kingdom of God will be definitively established through Christ's cross. God reigned from the wood. Now this exorcism of the Gerasene demoniac is a sign of the ultimate victory that Christ will accomplish and has accomplished over Satan and his legions through his sacrificial death on the cross. Jesus freed this man not merely from physical shackles and chains, but from slavery to sin and from the demonic. Jesus commands him to tell his friends what the Lord did for him and how he had had mercy on him, which implies that the man's possession was a result of his own personal sinfulness and that the Lord had freed him from that. And now, instead of cursing and speaking against God, he is commissioned by Jesus to evangelize to his friends, to spread the good news of the Lord's dominion, the Lord's victory over the demonic, over sin, over sin and death. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 395, teaches about the limited power of Satan. This is something that we should really keep in mind. In comparison to God, Satan's power is limited. He does not enjoy unlimited power. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He is only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is pure spirit, so we have to keep that in mind. He is pure spirit and he is very powerful, but he's still a creature. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign. Although Satan may act in the world out of hatred for God and his kingdom in Christ Jesus, and although his action may cause grave injuries of a spiritual nature and indirectly even of a, of a physical nature to each man and to society, the action is permitted by, by divine providence which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. It is a great mystery that providence should permit diabolical activity, but we know in everything God works for good those who love him. So although demonic possession still remains a real possibility, this is not the ordinary way that the demonic operates. Their primary work of trying to ruin souls is through temptation. The demons use temptation to cause souls to fall into hell. They're so malicious that they want to drag us down because they know they're already damned. They have no hope of salvation, but they want to drag the rest of us down with them because they're so malicious. And that's why they use temptation because they know that's how they can get us to separate ourselves from God. But in God's providential plan, God allows this temptation not because he wants us to fail, he wills that all men be saved, and he doesn't want us to be condemned forever, but he, does, he allows this temptation, he does not cause the temptation, we have to make that distinction, God does not cause the temptation, but he allows it to happen so that our love for God may be tested and that we may grow in virtue. This is how our Lord adds even more to the torment of the demons. The fact that when they see someone growing in virtue despite all of their best efforts to tempt a person and to you know, try to get them to separate themselves from God. I mean, just imagine how tormented they are by Our Lady. They couldn't even lay a finger on Our Lady. She was completely sinless. So it's, it's very easy for us to pay lip service and to, to profess our love for God, but our love for God is much more challenging when we face competing interests, 
when we're tempted by our lower faculties, by our passions, and by our emotions. God desires that we love him above all things with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's a very high task. And yet the slightest temptation often keeps us from giving God that total love that he deserves. And why does he deserve such a total self-giving love? Well, first of all, he created us, but also he first loved us. And he gave himself up for us on the cross. And St. Philip Neri says about temptation, do not grieve over the temptations you suffer. When the Lord intends to bestow a particular virtue on us, he often permits us first to be tempted by the opposite vice. Therefore, look upon every temptation as an invitation to grow to a, in a particular virtue and a promise by God that you will be successful if only you stand fast. So temptations are an inescapable reality in the spiritual life. And temptations in themselves are not sinful. What, what becomes sinful is what we do with the temptations if, we're, if we sin because of the temptation. So it is our task to have absolute trust in Jesus' power over the demonic and their attacks. Because it is only with Jesus, it is only with Jesus, the grace of God provided to us through prayer, through the sacraments, that we are empowered to resist temptation and to grow in virtue. Jesus has demonstrated that authority to us through the deliverance of this demoniac, this Gerasene demoniac. So we persevere against temptation by remaining united to the Lord through prayer, through fasting, through the sacraments. And then we cooperate with God's grace in resisting temptation and in growing in the practice of virtue. And there are no obstacles that are too great for the grace of God to overcome. God always provides sufficient grace for us in order to overcome temptation. We have to have that trust. It may seem like you're being tempted beyond your strength, but God always provides the grace. In fact, F Father Ripperger says that those who seem to experience even more hardships and greater temptations than others are actually being called to occupy an even higher place of glory in heaven. They have the potential, with God's grace, to become great saints. So, and we always have to make this qualification, with God's grace. It's not by our efforts alone. By our efforts alone, we will fail. We do not overcome temptation by our own power. It is primarily with God's grace and the contribution of our own human effort, our own virtue. <laughs> Yet although we rely on grace, our efforts must be wholehearted. In order to grow in virtue, we have to resist and we have to do it wholeheartedly. We must remain united with the Lord as we take up our cross daily and follow after him. And if we remain faithful and persevere to the end, we will have the blessed promise of the everlasting joy of our Father's house.